This week on Jerusalem Dateline, CBN founder Pat Robertson interviews President Donald Trump at the White House. It was a great G20. We had 20 countries. I got along, I think, really fantastically with the head of every country. Plus, a look at the prophetic connection between CBN and the Six Day War. And see how a UN organization ignores 4,000 years of Jewish history. And a look at Jerusalem's new water wonderland. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. CBN founder Pat Robertson sat down with U.S. President Donald Trump at the White House and discussed a number of issues, including North Korea, the U.S. relationship with Russia, and what's happening here in the Middle East. Here's a portion of that interview. Well, Mr. President, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so proud of everything you're doing. Thank Let you. me ask you, uh, you have just gotten back from the G20. Uh, you were traveling around the world. What do you see as the major problem facing the world today? What's the major? Well, we have many problems. Yeah. And I was left a very, very uh, tough meal, I will say that. Yeah. Pat. It, was, uh, it was a mess. And I think we're doing very well. But North Korea certainly is a big problem. The Middle East is a total mess. Yeah. Other than in five months, we have done more against ISIS than anybody's done since the beginning. And we're you know, having tremendous success mm -hmm. with that. But I would have to say uh, Middle East is in a you know, tough situation, but we're getting it straightened out. And ultimately, mm -hmm. we want to start investing money back in the United States at our home. Yeah. But we have to get rid of ISIS. We have to get rid of the terrorists, as you know better than anybody. And the other is uh, North Korea. We have somebody that is, we will find out what he is. We're going to find out. Uh, and He has launched uh, uh, intercontinental missiles. Uh, is there a possibility that we might want to uh, knock some of those down on the launch pad or right after launch? Well, you know, we wouldn't want to be speaking about anything, but we're looking at lots of different ways. We're working with other countries, including China. I think China would like to see this problem go away. It's a big problem for them. And, you know, the advantage we have is trade. We have big trade with China. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a very good relationship with President Xi, who I like a lot. And I think he likes me. We were just spending a lot of time together. And they are very strong with regard to, as you know, with regard to North Korea. Will, will they get tough with North Korea? I mean, I know that you were so close when he yeah. was there to visit Mar-a-Lago. Well, we're going to see. We're going to yeah. see. I mean, I, I would say that uh, we had a good chance. They had an election where President Moon got elected to South Korea. Yeah. He has a much different attitude or a much different take on how to handle the situation than his predecessor in South Korea. Uh, he's uh, perhaps softer on the issue, but mm -hmm. maybe not, because I like him a lot. I think he's, uh, I think he's gonna be a strong person and a strong, I think he's got a strong view, yeah. stronger than people would understand. So we'll see how it all works out. Uh, I think China wants to help us. We're gonna find out whether or not they do, but China would, in my opinion, like to be able to help us. What's our leverage with them? Well, our leverage with China is that China makes hundreds of billions of dollars a year with mm -hmm. us on trade, and I want to renegotiate trade deals. But I would certainly be a lot easier in a trade deal if they were going to help us with North Korea sure. than if they weren't. So we're going to see. The relationship is very good with China. It's very good with the president of China, who's a terrific person. Mm -hmm. uh, we will find out whether or not they want to help, and maybe they do and maybe they don't. What about that uh, consortium of Arab nations that went against Qatar? Well, you, you, your Secretary of State was not uh, too uh, favorable to what was being done. How are we going to handle that one? Well, uh, Rex is doing a terrific job, yeah. but he and I had a little bit of a difference only in terms of tone. Uh -huh. So we went to Saudi Arabia. We had one of the great meetings ever, mm -hmm. 54 Muslim countries. And I got up, made a speech, got nice reviews. Yeah. It's almost like you make it a speech. Yeah. But I said, we've got to stop the funding of terrorism. Mm -hmm. Tremendous money. And they're funding terrorism. Yeah. So we've got to stop it. So they are working very hard on that. And I believe they're going to do it. It was one of the most incredible two days. Uh, as an example, Saudi Arabia put up hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. of money going into buying our planes and our military equipment right. and investing in our country. And I said, you have to do that, otherwise I'm not going. So they spent hundreds of billions of dollars right in front of us. I mean, they were signing and big people from the biggest countries mm -hmm. and companies, General Electric and all of the big 
companies, many of them were there getting contracts, all good work for our workers. That was one of the things. But the other thing is that, and very important to me, was the funding of terrorism mm -hmm. has to stop. And they fund terrorism, some of those countries, many of those countries. So we had a tremendous summit, and I think things are going to work out. I think it was a very, very important and very impressive two days. Oh, and absolutely. now, as you know, Qatar, yeah. which a lot of people call it Qatar, yeah. but Qatar is now a little bit on the outs, but I think they're being brought back in because they were known as a funder of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And we said, you can't do that. You can't do that. We have to starve the beast, yeah. right? And the beast is terrorism. We've got so we big, can't have wealthy countries funding that beast. How do we handle that big military installation we've got in Qatar? What do we do with that? Well, we'll be all right. Look, if we ever had to leave, uh, we would have 10 countries willing to build us another one, okay. believe me. And they'll pay for it. You know, the days of us paying for things are going to be largely over. <laughs> they'll start paying. Sure. You know, we go out, we build, we this, we that. But you're right. Uh, Qatar, uh, we're going to have a good relationship with Qatar. And we're not going to have a problem with the military base. But if we ever needed another military base, you have other countries that would gladly build it. Believe okay. me. You went to the G20 and you met for the first time front face to face with Vladimir Putin. And... Uh, George Bush had once said he stared into his soul and came away satisfied. What do you think? Can we trust him? Well, look, we had a good meeting. Uh, I think we had an excellent meeting. One thing we did is we have a ceasefire in yes, a sir. major part of Syria yeah. where there was tremendous bedlam and tremendous killing. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is now four days. The ceasefire is held for four days. Those ceasefires haven't held at all. That's mm -hmm. because President Putin and President Trump made the deal Mm -hmm. And it's held. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe as we're speaking, they start shooting again. But this has held, unlike all of the other ceasefires that didn't mean anything. Uh, so that was a great thing that came out of that meeting. I think a lot of things came out of that meeting. Mm -hmm. But I do believe it's important to have a dialogue. And if you don't have a dialogue, it's a lot of problems for our country and for their country. I think we need dialogue. We need dialogue with everybody. Sure. Mr. President, thank you so much for being with thank us. You, it's Pat. always a joy to see you. Such a great honor. And we're thank so you, proud Pat. of what you're doing. Thank you very much. If you'd like to see the entire interview, you can go to CBN.com. Well, Pat Robertson wasn't the only evangelical leader to meet with the president. A number of faith leaders gathered in the Oval Office to pray for President Trump. Tony Perkins, Pastor John Hagee, Ralph Reed, Michelle Bachman, and many others were also there. Johnny Moore, former senior vice president at Liberty University, posted pictures of the prayer time. But he says it was much more than just a photo op. Moore says it shows a substantive relationship between the evangelical community and this administration. He added that faith leaders are enjoying frequent access to officials throughout the Trump administration. Coming up, the connection between Israel, CBN, and the Six-Day War. Something just responded within me. I knew this had enormous significance. Well, we just saw that interview with CBN founder Pat Robertson and U.S. President Donald Trump. Fifty years ago, Robertson felt something momentous happened on June 5, 1967, when the historic Six-Day War between Israel and the Arab nations began. During that war, Israeli forces reunited Jerusalem for the first time in nearly 2,000 years. And on that same day, CBN also took a major step forward. In June of 1967, Israel found itself fighting for survival for the third time in less than 20 years. And now what's known as the Six-Day War, Israel's Arab enemies fought with one purpose, the destruction of the Jewish state. And half a world away from the besieged nation, God was raising up a friend. We dedicated the start of construction of a new phase of our building in Portsmouth, and the ceremony uh, was over when one of our board members came and said, they've just started war uh, in Israel. Something just responded within me. I knew this had enormous significance, that we at CBN were linked with Israel, and that this had to do with the last time. It had to do with the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus made when he said, Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 
This is the war that liberated East Jerusalem. The peace did not last, however. In 1973, Egypt and Syria attacked again, this time on Yom Kippur, Israel's holiest day of the year. An unprepared Israel almost lost that war, and the high casualty rate left many in the country disillusioned. A 1974 CBN special brought a message of hope to a war-weary nation. It became so obvious to every one of us in this country that the threat was to the very existence of the newly born Jewish state. Here was uh, the general, actually, under Moshe Dayan, who had uh, captured Jerusalem. Now he'd become prime minister. But I had a sense that uh, Israel was so alone. He was, there was a sadness in his voice. He asked America to be strong. And at that point, I made a vow that whatever happened, however unpopular it would be, that uh, we and those associated with us would stand with Israel, that we would be the friend of Israel, regardless. And over these 30, 35 years, I've kept that vow. Three years later, CBN dedicated its satellite Earth station. As a preview of things to come, the first satellite image received came from the Mount of Olives. Since then, the alliance between CBN and Israel has only grown stronger. In 2001, a news bureau opened in the heart of Jerusalem to bring a prophetic understanding of end-time events. The march of history is leading back to the city of Jerusalem, and it's vital for CBN News to be here reporting on the events before the return of Jesus Christ. At Pat Robertson's 75th birthday celebration in 2005, Benjamin Netanyahu sent a stirring thank you to Pat for his friendship to Israel. Pat Robertson has been a magnificent friend of Israel and he's been a personal friend of mine. Uh, I felt that we had no greater friend in the world, and I mean that, we have no greater friend in the world than Pat Robertson. In August of 2006, Pat traveled to Israel during the war to demonstrate his support. I'm here, among other things, to tell your people that the Evangelical Christians of America are with you, we're praying for you. We pray for the nation of Israel. CBN also has shown its humanitarian commitment to those living in Israel. Through Operation Blessing and Eli Israel, CBN has helped Israelis in need, including survivors of the Holocaust. CBN News now sends Jerusalem Dateline, an award-winning half-hour weekly program around the world through broadcast and the internet, where it's translated into languages like Korean and Finnish. And In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem is the most ambitious project of CBN's Middle East documentary team, with more specials on the way. CBN's ties to Israel remain strong and steadfast, and we will be there to report the prophetic events that herald the day of the Messiah's return. This is the, the land that the Lord is going to visit. He's coming back again to Israel. Up next, we visit Hebron, the site of a controversial UN vote. I think that uh, the claims that the uh, site is under danger are baseless. Israeli officials reacted angrily to a UNESCO vote that declared the Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron a Palestinian site in danger. Here's a story I did from Hebron about the decision that ignores the Bible and 4,000 years of Jewish history. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu read from the book of Genesis at the weekly cabinet meeting. The connection between the Jewish people and Hebron and the tomb of the patriarchs is one of purchase and of history which may be without parallel in the history of peoples. The tomb of the patriarchs here in Hebron goes back to the book of Genesis. The Bible says that Abraham bought this field for 400 shekels and then buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field of Machpelah. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and their wives were buried there more than 2,000 years before Islam was founded. Of course, this did not prevent the UNESCO World Heritage Committee last Friday from passing yet another delusional resolution which determined that the tomb of the patriarchs, the same cave of Machpelah, is a Palestinian heritage site. 
Following the resolution, Netanyahu said Israel would cut $1 million from its UN dues and use it instead to establish a Jewish heritage museum in Hebron. I think that uh, the claims that uh, society is under danger are baseless. Yitzhak Ryder is an expert on holy places. The motivation is dual. The one is uh, to score points for a future negotiation, saying that, claiming the ownership of and sovereignty over the cave of the patriarchs and also on Hebron. And the other one is to just prevent Israelis from taking uh, over more uh, space in the site. King Herod built the structure over the cave 2,000 years ago. You can tell by the unique architectural style. 1,200 years later, the Muslim Mamluk conquerors modified the structure and added the minarets. They now consider it the Al-Ibrahimi Mosque. It's the mosque and surrounding Mamluk structures that Palestinians say are in danger. Under Israel's authority, Jews, Christians, Muslims and anyone else can pray at the site. But Hebron's deputy mayor, Yusuf al-Jabari, said he'd change that if he could. It is a pure Muslim mosque. It is a place for Muslim worshippers. And we would do all our efforts and everything we can in order to return this place to being a mosque for Muslim prayers only. Some believe the UNESCO vote is just one more battlefront in a campaign to erase any Jewish ties to the land of the Bible. By the way, when we went to Hebron to report on this story, it was remarkably quiet with people going to the cave of the patriarchs to pray. So the decision hasn't affected the day-to-day -day status of the site. On another subject, there's probably not a person watching now that hasn't been affected by cancer. But now, as Lori Johnson tells us, a new drug is providing hope for people suffering from the dreaded disease. Scientists at Raphael Pharmaceuticals believe their new drug, CPI-613, is a breakthrough for people suffering from some of the most devastating types of cancer, such as pancreatic, lymphoma, and lung. This is a vial of CPI-613. It's administered to cancer patients intravenously in a hospital. Each infusion lasts up to two hours. Cancer cells have different nutritional needs than healthy cells. CPI-613 targets cancer metabolism, which is a relatively new way of treating the disease. I think uh, at Raphael, we're really on the cusp of some very exciting times ahead in the field of oncology. CPI-613 has performed very well in clinical trials and could be on the market as soon as next year. But people who need it right now might qualify for what's called compassionate use. So we uh, currently do not charge for compassionate use. We actually believe uh, in helping and so we currently give our drug uh, without charging anything for compassionate use. CPI 613 reportedly has fewer side effects than other cancer drugs. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Up next, join us for a tour of Jerusalem's new water wonderland. Israel is known as the land of the Bible. It's also rich in archaeological treasures, and it's a place of innovation and technology. It even has a biblical zoo. And that's where Jerusalem is opening up a new aquarium, the first of its kind in the Middle East. And as CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, it also promises to tell Israel's water story. This tunnel under the Mediterranean Sea exhibit is bound to be one of the main attractions at the new Gottesman Family Israel Aquarium, Jerusalem. The tunnel is part of a 400,000 gallon tank at the aquarium which is part of Jerusalem's biblical zoo. It will hold sharks and other fish from the Mediterranean Sea. We are addressing and emphasize only one issue, the local habitats. We will deal only with the Med Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, a little bit of the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Biblical Zoo and Israel Aquarium CEO Shai Daron said one of the main thrusts is to raise awareness about wildlife habitat preservation in the sea. Not only to look what the sea can give us to us, fishing, desalination, gas drilling, oil, transportation, security. We need to start as in Israelis and tourists from all over the world to start to understand that the sea, the ocean, is an habitat. 
The aquarium aims to have something for everyone, like this interactive pop-up. It puts you right in the middle of the Red Sea coral reef, surrounded by clownfish. In here, wanted to address some zooming phenomena, like the fact that we have rays in the Red Sea. In other places, visitors have to search for the treasures. It's uh, again part of, you know, the, the new trend of visiting zoos and aquariums. Not everything you see immediately. It's discovering process. In a pre-opening tour, CBN News was given a behind-the-scenes look at the core of the aquarium, the breeding, research, and quarantine center. We are above the big med tank. This is the access for the aquaries, for the divers, to come and to take the daily walk. The path ends at what's called the commitment room. There, visitors are urged to pledge to protect sea life by promising not to drive four by fours along the shore and not to take seashells or bring plastic bags to the beach. When we are finding a shark or a whale or sea turtles dead, we open the stomach, we see it full of plastic bags. Why plastic bags? It's not tasty, but those creatures think that those are plastic bags are jellyfish. Even though there are great aquariums around the world, Daron says this one has something special. The view of Jerusalem Hill is part of the experience. This view is unique only to Jerusalem. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Israel Aquarium, Jerusalem. If you do come to Jerusalem, I'm sure you'll enjoy a visit to the new aquarium. When you come, you may hear a Hebrew expression, leat leat. Here's an explanation on our Hebrew Word Wednesday. Leat, 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 leat. Leat, leat. Slowly, slowly. Leat, leat. Leat, leat. Leat, leat. Slowly, slowly, or easy, easy. That's just one example of what you can find on our Facebook page, but there's much, much more. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Well, that's it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.